thank you for joining us today. My name is Chris Ball. I'm CEO of Reliance Insurance. And uh, I am very delighted to host Rick and Sadie Bowman of IC3. They do a lot of strategic consulting for companies. Um, this is not the least of which are some of the things they do. And you might be wondering what's, what, what's our, uh, an insurance broker or insurance company doing talking about remote employment and engagement scores. And in this case, it's, it's a matter of, we understand that insurance is critical. It's certainly a very important part of what we do every day. Uh, however, it's not enough to help prevent things from going wrong. And it's not enough to help you recover from things going wrong. And anything that we can do to mitigate your risks, whether it's insurable or not, and in this case, employee engagement is not insurable, um, we want to be there for you and bring that extra value to the relationship. We are always looking for opportunities, um, people, ideas to share with our clients and our prospective clients in hopes that we can help them be a better organization. If you're better and you grow successfully and you as a decision maker are not distracted by as much noise, then you're going to be more successful and we'll be more successful with you as a result of that. And that sort of comes back to the Reliance model being protection beyond insurance. And if you walk around our office here, you'll see that that sticker and that sign plastered all over the place so that people here are engaged, always thinking about ways that we can try and go a little above and beyond. The insurance is important and it's necessary and it's critical. It's a, it's a lifeline when you really have a serious event, but all the day-to-day -day things that happen um, are some of the things that we also like to think about. So without further ado, we'll start uh, moving into the process. And just a reminder, everyone is muted currently and we'll be taking questions at the end. And we do encourage you to ask as many questions as you would like. There's a couple of ways of doing that. One is you can go into the chat and make sure you send it to everyone and put your question in there. <laughs> the second option would be to raise your hand. There's a little hand icon that you can use for that. Or thirdly, you can just unmute and ask away. Uh, but we do encourage you to do so. So I'm excited to get going today. Um, and right now I'm gonna turn it over to Rick and Sadie to talk about what, what's happening out there, guys? What are the trends you're seeing? Chris, thank you very much. And before we start, I'd like to uh, just offer my appreciation and thanks for the effort that you and your team have put into mounting this workshop series. And it's a real honor to be part of it. So thank you. I don't know about you, but uh, precisely on the morning of March the 12th, our lives, our business lives, and our personal lives changed probably forever. And COVID-19 became an everyday word. Those organizations that could responded very quickly and pivoted to a working from home model. That brought with it some new challenges that uh, had perhaps been there but had not been relevant to uh, what it took to get through a business day. The first thing was the way we all deal with change. Some of us, a very few of us, really relish change and go, go looking for it. Most are somewhere in the middle on their response to change. And a significant number of people resist change mightily because they find it very stressful. And that's the way we're wired from the factory, so there's really nothing much we can do about that. But the wor pivot to working from home put a spotlight on our ability to cope with change. And our new workplace was in some cases not ideal and not designed to be a workplace at all, but rather to be a personal space, a living space. And then when you add the whole family to the workplace scene, it creates a very stressful challenge for people to find someplace where they can work quietly without background noise, adding to their phone calls and video calls to clients and colleagues. Then of course, there's the social needs. The introverts are quite happy working from home with the fewer interruptions than they might encounter in the office. The extroverts are starved. They're looking for social interaction and it's much harder to get when you're isolated and working on your own from home. And last but not least, we remove a thing we call peer power in when we're working in the working from home model. And the pure power as we see it is that ability that I have to quickly and briefly turn to a coworker. How do you do this? 
I can't remember what the number was for that. What do you think about this idea? I thought you were going to have that done before lunch. All those interactions that augment the relationship of the organization to its goals. So in summation, lots of stress bubbled over the top from the pivot to working from home. And that gave rise to a very serious concern about the emotional health of those members of the team that are working from home. So we had questions. We had questions because we care about our people, of course, and we had concerns because we care about the results our people produce and our obligation to our clients and uh, to our coworkers and suppliers. So I think it would be worth our time today to spend just a few moments reflecting on the connection between emotional health and results. So I would offer to you this model. I believe that our mo emotional health drives our engagement. So the better I feel about myself and my work and my degree of control of my environment, the greater will be my ability to engage in the work at hand and the tasks that are assigned to me and the mission of the organization. My level of engagement has a direct bearing on performance and I'll offer you some proof of that statement in just a few moments. But the better, the higher our level of engagement, the higher our level of performance. And the better we're performing in our job, the better the experience is that the customer will be enjoying. And the better the customer experience, the better the business results. And usually the better the business results, the better the climate in the organization and the fostering of positive emotional health. So that's, that's a model which I offer to you for your consideration. And before we go much further, I'd like to make a distinction between engagement and satisfaction. Uh, these words are often used interchangeably. And when we talk about employee surveys, we often hear the phrase employee satisfaction survey. Big, big difference between engagement and satisfaction. So engagement is defined as the willingness of an employee to invest their discretionary time in advancing the interests of the company. Whereas satisfaction is how I feel about my work. Am I happy? So in fact, what we could have right now, given the challenging work environment, we could have a highly engaged, let's say, salesperson on our team who loves their work, loves the company, loves their clients, but they could be very dissatisfied because they're having to reinvent the way they sell. And they may be encountering a, a dry patch in terms of results. So a highly engaged employee can at times be very, very deeply dissatisfied. So we're not talking about satisfaction here, we're talking about engagement. So a moment ago, I promised you some proof of these, the connection that I offered between engagement and performance and results. And I would offer you the source of my proof as the Gallup Corporation. And Gallup has a massive database of employee survey information that they've been accumulating for many, many years. And the way they express one analysis of their data is by comparing the companies that have the top 25% of employee engagement scores versus the companies that have the bottom 25% of employee engagement scores. And they contrast the results achieved by those two categories. The upper category, the top 25% in employee engagement scores demonstrate 37% less absenteeism than the bottom 25%. They have 49% fewer safety accidents, 60% fewer defects. They are 31% more productive and bottom line, 61% more profitable. So I think that's pretty much a slam dunk case for the worthiness of devoting a lot of time and attention to employee engagement because 
It's not only good for people, but it's good for the company's results. But given all of this, there's a problem, a real concern. Gallup tells us that 75% of employed people are either partially or totally disengaged from their work. So think about that. That's a huge number. Flipped the other way, it means only 25% of the workforce out there is engaged. What's even more alarming, and perhaps not an issue right now because of the difficulty in job changing, but their stats at Gallup show that 51% of employees are actually job hunting. Now, an organization called Resource Development Systems a number of years ago took the Gallup data and monetized it, tried to express in economic terms what the stats that are on your screen right now actually translate to. And the scary result of that exercise was that 37 cents of every payroll dollar is lost through disengagement of employees. So I think that makes a pretty strong case for why employee engagement is a real opportunity and may be a real concern in your organization. It may or may not, but it's certainly worth exploring. So let's loop back now to emotional health of the employees. And what we're trying to do is to find out how we're doing. And the method that a lot of organizations are using a lot of individual leaders is when they have a one-to-one -one contact with a working at home member of their team, they ask this question, how's it going? Well, the question is well intended, but I would submit that it's not gonna give you the answer that you're really looking for. The problems with asking how's it going are numerous. The person asking the question almost always says position power. So the employee is going to be wondering, what's the right answer to this question? So you're almost invariably going to get an answer like, oh, I'm doing okay, or I'm doing fine, or I'm coping, or no problem. It's the, co the correct answer, they believe. The other uh, intimidating factor is job insecurity. So a lot of employees are wondering, will our company be able to survive the COVID-19 pandemic? Will there be a job for me? Will I be replaced or done away with altogether? Even if those two factors are not at work, listening is hard. So if I'm a leader and my team, rather than sitting in a few hundred square feet of office space where I can see them all with one sweep of my eyes to a dispersed workforce, I'm going to be having a number of conversations now and trying to listen and listen actively to what people are saying when I ask how's it going is going to be really tough. And if it's not a video call, I'm going to be minus body language. So listening and getting the real meaning of what the response is, is going to be very difficult. Even if I listen effectively, the gathering of data will be done inconsistently. It will depend on my memory, maybe some hastily jotted notes, but certainly not a body of data that we can massage and analyze and figure out how to respond. So there needs to be a better way, and the good news is that there is a better way. This is a way that works, that uses methodology that Chris briefly alluded to a few moments ago. And we're going to actually walk you through that. It's based on the idea of conducting an anonymous survey that consists of two kinds of questions, very specific questions or statements, which we ask the employee to agree with or disagree with, and then open narrative questions, which allow people just to ramble. Now that data that we get from the narrative questions is obviously much harder to massage and interpret, but it's nonetheless very, very informative. One word of caution, if you're saying, yeah, I know about all this and uh, I can do it, 
don't ask questions to which you are not willing to respond. In other words, if you're asking about a, a work condition and you really have no intention of changing that work condition, don't ask the question that you will actually be making the disengagement worse. So that's a caution to keep in mind. Now, before Sadie walks you through the uh, process and model, uh, Chris is going to uh, describe to you an offer that's on the table. Chris? Yeah, thanks, Rick. So everyone that is attending today um, can receive a complimentary survey workshop from Rick and Sadie. Reliance has collaborated with them and it's our gift to you to help your company uh, try and move the needle on engagement um, and be more resilient through the COVID crisis and uh, have higher return from your employees and have them feel better about the experience. So just know that you're all eligible. There, there's no hook. Um, you, just, you get a complimentary uh, employee engagement score and um, we'll put the information on that at the end of this. And now we'll just kind of move through how it worked, how, how it works, what the data shows. And we're going to talk a little bit about reliance is experience with this because we actually went through it. Great. So I am going to give you a little bit of an overview of how it works. Um, you've heard from Rick um, the importance of measuring and improving employee engagement. And now you've heard the offer from Chris. I'm going to walk you through um, how um, the survey process works and uh, actually show you how a report looks and how you can interpret the results in a report. So first of all, uh, to get the survey launched, um, if you reach out to me, I can set it up, send you a link, uh, send you a boilerplate invitation message that you can use uh, to invite your uh, staff to complete. Give them a few days to complete the survey. I'll collect the data, develop a report, and we will set up a debrief conversation. Generally, it'll be a conversation similar to what we're doing right now, where we can actually look at the report together and uh, come up with an action plan um, after you've been able to uh, sort of come to a conclusion about some of the issues that your employees have brought forward. Um, from there, you will communicate that action plan to your employees. You will follow through, you'll do it. And then probably um, six to eight weeks afterwards, we may want to do another survey just so that we can have a look at uh, the impact that your action has had on your employee uh, engagement results. So that's how it works. Uh, and basically, if we look back on some of the things Rick talked about earlier, the challenges that were um, sort of came to the forefront when COVID-19 hit, uh, we wanted to really focus on those challenges to come up with five key questions so that we really were uh, honing in on the areas that were the most concerning to employers and employees. So we came up with what we call five uh, key questions. And actually, they're not questions. Like Rick said, they're more statements that we've made uh, where we ask the employee to measure uh, this statement on a scale of zero to 10, where 10 would equal um, highly agree, strongly agree, and zero would equal strongly disagree. So basically, the first, the first uh, statement we ask them to measure is, my home workspace allows me to focus on my work. Now, some people um, have had no issue with this at all, but a, no, a large number of people really do not have a place in their home that would be distraction free and allow them to set up their workspace. So that was something we really wanted to measure. The second statement we asked them to measure was, I'm making good progress with establishing a new daily routine. Again, some people um, made that uh, transition quite easily, but others had a real difficult time in dealing with uh, how do I how do I make this new routine work that I had before? How do I make it work in my home office? And it was a difficult transition. The third item, and probably one of the bigger ones, was that uh, we wanted them to measure. I'm even though I'm working from home, the steps my leader has taken makes me feel connected to my team. This was a big one because a lot of people. Um, we're really suffering with the isolation and the fact that they, um, they lost that connection with their leader and with their teammates. So we wanted to measure that. Uh, the fourth statement we asked them to measure was, I clearly understand what my manager expects from me in my work from home environment. Um, performance management expectations and having clarity around them 
that's difficult enough in a regular work environment uh, before COVID even came along. But now that we've added the whole work from home element to the picture, it's really um, increased the, um, the level of confusion that some staff members have had around what is expected of them. And the la fifth and the last uh, item we've asked them to measure is when I'm working from home, I have the tools and equipment I need to do my job well. And this is one where a lot of people had issues with this because really just the quick transition um, to their home office, um, some people had a home office already, but for others sitting at their kitchen table uh, without the proper equipment became a real issue. It's probably what though the one that most employers were able to have a quick and easy fix with because they allowed their staff to take uh, some of their uh, equipment from work home with them so that they have uh, better equipment at home. So we asked them to measure all three, all five of these statements. And then with each one of the statements, if any of the scores were uh, less than nine, a drop down would appear. And that would allow them the opportunity to give us that um, verbatim feedback where they could, like there's, we ask, we ask it in a way that what is the one thing that we could do differently that would help in this area, depending on the question that we're, or the uh, statement that they're responding to. And so we've gotten a lot of really great feedback uh, with the verbatim option. And so Sadie, just so I, I can kind of just sort of summarize it up a little bit. It really, the questions are focusing on, you know, the, the space because now people are, not, it's not just them working from home, it's their spouses working from home, it's their kids schooling from home, it's the dog walking all over everybody and while they're all trying to find space at home. I mean, it's, this is kind of an unprecedented example of working from home versus I'm the only one there and now everybody is there. Exactly, yes. Uh, and like you say, a lot of people, I mean, it, it may have been the normal thing that they've always done. They've worked from home, they have an office, they close the door and everything is fine. But mm -hmm. this is not normal for everyone. And you're right, they've got all these other distractions, especially people who have children who they've been homeschooled because the schools have been closed as well. So it's been a real tough transition for some. Yeah, and then enabling people to be able to stick to the routine, having some kind of sense of connection, mm -hmm. um, understanding what, what, you know, are my expectations the same? Are they different now? Has anyone actually clarified that to me? And, exactly. um, you know, what, what kind of support do I have around tools? I don't know. Has that been discussed? It's, it's a lot. Yeah. And these were the issues that um, we did. We did a fair bit of research before we developed these, these statements or these questions. Um, before we actually pulled the survey together, we really wanted to make sure that these were the key areas that people were having their biggest challenge with. So I think we really hit the nail on the head when we developed these these questions or these statements. Okay, so now we've, we've collected or we'll have all of this um, information that we've uh, gathered from our employee feedback. Now we have to score it. How are we gonna score it? Well, there are uh, options available and averaging is one option that is available, but we do not agree with averages. We find them to be very misleading. And I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. Uh, the scoring method that we use is a top box method that allows us to take the data and, and um, uh, create, create um, a, a net engagement score, calculate a net engagement score. So, um, okay, so I'll tell you a little bit more now about why we do not use averages and then more about the top box rating. So uh, here's a, an example, three examples actually, where we have average scores of eight. There are three separate departments of 10 people and there's an average score of eight in all three departments. In the first uh, scenario, and that is the far to the left scenario, we have five people in the, of the 10 who gave a score of seven and five people of the 10 that gave a score of nine. Um, that's give you an average of eight, which probably isn't so far off. The second scenario, all 10 people gave a score of eight. It's spot on, that's exactly correct, uh, an average of eight. But the third scenario, the far to the right, this is the most typical that you see when you have people score uh, any kind of a survey. Uh, you have scores that are all over the place. And in this case here, we've got a, almost a third of the people who are very excited and happy and satisfied with what's going on in their in this particular situation that they're being scored on. And then you've got a, another third of them 
that are totally dissatisfied, and then you've got the rest that are somewhere in between. That is not telling anyone like us when we're trying to look at data and come up with conclusions about what the issues are and how to deal with them. This is not telling you anything. It's not helping you in any way. So basically what we do is we use a top box rating method. And top box rating, I should have mentioned this earlier, this is not something we invented or we created ourselves. This is a method that was uh, introduced by a guy by the name of Fred Reichelt back in 2006 when he uh, wrote the book, uh, Unleashing Excellence. No, not Unleashing Excellence, The Ultimate Question. <laughs> Too many books on my mind. Um, the Ultimate Question. And so it's a, it's a very um, accurate way of measuring uh, engagement results. So top, top box is what we use. Uh, employee engagement scores are leading indicators. And by that we mean that we can take the results of these scores and we can actually make reliable predictions about what these, what these people will do and the future behavior of these people. So what we do, how it works is we categorize the scores into three groups. We have um, the groups of people or the scores of people, your staff, who gave you any score from uh, nine and 10. We'll call these people the promoters and they're in green in this graph uh, in front of you. So the promoters are people that are actually speaking very positively, positively about your organization. And uh, they are, we can actually say that we can predict that future behavior of these people, the promoters will be positive. They'll always continue to speak positively of your organization. On the other hand, if we look at the people who have scored you with a score of six and below, and that's the people that will show up in the red uh, box uh, on the graph in front of you. These people are what Fred Reichelt would refer to as your detractors. And the detractors, we can make po uh, predictions about their future behavior as well, but it will be negative future behavior. They're probably speaking very negatively about your organization, and they're probably those ones Rick was talking about earlier that are already looking for employment elsewhere. So we can make predictions about the um, promoters and the detractors. But when we look at the scores for the uh, people who gave you the sevens and eights, uh, Fred Reichelt referred to these people as the passives people, passive people. Passives are people that we really can't predict what they're gonna do in the future. They could be your future promoters, or they could also be your future detractors. We can't really predict what the passives are going to do in the future. So now that we've collected this and we've, we've calculated these scores, we can now develop um, a net engagement score simply by deducting the scores of your detractors from the scores of your promoters. That will give you a net engagement score. Uh, we do not uh, take into consideration the um, passives simply because they are unpredictable. Okay, so that's how we're gonna do our scoring. We're gonna use the net engagement uh, process with a top box. Now I'm gonna, okay, what is a good score? Okay, so basically when, when you think about this, how do you know if your score is good? So basically, if you have a score that is less than 50%, you can kind of look at that and say, well, I could probably do some work here. This needs a little bit of work. If it's 50% or greater, that's a good score. We, we like those scores. And if you're in the score uh, category of 75% or above, that's best of class. So if you're in that category, you know you're doing a really good job. Okay, so let's take a look at a report, what a report looks like. Um, the way the report is designed, we will have a snapshot like this for each one of the five uh, statements that we've asked the employees to um, rate you on. So basically what, what is on this report, it's very simple to read, um, is in the upper left corner, you will see the number of responses. And in this case, we have 45. Uh, no no um, employee has skipped this question, but if anyone had, you would see that there as well. Um, beneath that, you'll see with the color coding, um, how your scores were, um, how they varied from one score to the next. Uh, your, your twos, your threes, your fives, and et cetera. Um, and if you go to the far right of that, you'll see exactly the same information, but it's in a pie chart. And beneath that, you'll see the percentage in that pie chart that you've got 
37.8% detractors, 24.4% passives, and 37.8% promoters. So we're going to calculate a net engagement score simply by deducting the detractors from the promoters, which will result in 0% at this, in this case. So in this case here, you would know for sure, based on the uh, previous slide, we have a bit of work to do here. That's what your report's going to look like. Now, in addition to that, we also have a bunch of, uh, a bunch, uh, we have a lot of verbatim feedback that would go with each and every one of these um, uh, statements that we've asked the employees to rate. So next, okay, after we have pulled the report together, um, I will then send that report to you. Uh, we will arrange um, a debrief conversations where we'll go through the results, uh, discuss the results and come up with an action plan. And that will really be um, something where you're gonna kind of look at what will you do about these results? What will you do? What did you learn? What can you do about it? What will you do about it? Because sometimes there's things that you maybe are able to do, but maybe it just doesn't work for you. So what did you learn? What can you do about it? What will you do about it? And basically communicate that to the employees and then follow through and do it. Um, and as mentioned earlier, um, after you've done that, after you've followed through with your employees and given them the information and told them what you're going to do and actually did it, we'll do a survey, another survey, probably six to eight weeks afterwards, and just find out um, how people are responding to the action that you've taken. And you might ask, does that work? And actually, we've got that proof that it does work. Uh, we had a wonderful uh, experience here with uh, Reliance where we actually conducted the survey with them uh, back shortly after um, COVID hit, probably a few weeks into it after you had moved the, um, the folks from the office home. And we had the five uh, categories of um, statements that we've asked their staff to rate. And we'll find that the scores that we received are what's on the slide here. Uh, when we asked the uh, home workspace uh, statement, we had a 49% score, net engagement score, which really is not a bad score when you think about the categories that we gave you earlier, the 50% sort of being that um, uh, benchmark. The, ooh, ooh, lots of feedback. The uh, second topic that we um, asked them to rate was the da new daily routine. And it seems that the uh, Reliance Group, they transitioned quite well into the new daily re routine because the net engagement score was 67%. And communication uh, and the connection with the team, had a, we had a 0% um, uh, net engagement score on this category, which is not uncommon. This was a very common one that a lot of people had issues with particularly in the first um, few weeks after um, the work from home transition occurred. The fourth one, performance management, clarity of expectations, 64%, which is a, an amazing score. And the fifth one, tools and equipment. Do I have the tools and equipment to do my job well? 25% net engagement score. So Reliance took this information and they came up with an action plan. And Chris is gonna give you a little more on that. Sure. Thanks, Sadie. Uh, it was interesting to go through the process because previously we had no benchmark to work from uh, in terms of how to reach out to people in a way that is meaningful and is going to move the needle on any of these any of these issues. And so, you know, we our first thing to do was to just have a, a message from our, our president uh, to everyone, thanking them, acknowledging what they had to say, and getting clarity around what we were going to do, how we were going to do it, and some things that perhaps we weren't going to do. But all in all, acknowledging that everybody was in, you know, this sort of weird new reality, we're all in it together, and that uh, we're going to look for ways to get through this as smoothly as possible as, as a team, and that we've, we've got their backs. And it started when we saw the 0% on communication, that was low-hanging fruit, um, and that's when we went to weekly Zoom meetings for most departments. So getting people to check in, ask them how they were, uh, and focusing on people in those Zoom meetings, not having an agenda that I think spoke to some of their daily routine issues. Um, I also made a point of reaching out to everybody one-on-one, uh, -on -one, either by 
phone or voicemail, just letting them know that I was available, that uh, we understood that people are going through some adjustment periods. And, um, you know, just reminding us all that to be grateful that we're in a career such as insurance where, you know, we're not working in hospitality that has taken a real big hit throughout this. You know, we still have clients that we want to continue to support and make sure that we do our best job for them. Uh, from there, we, we looked at focusing on things like ARs. Obviously, there's concerns about, about those falling behind and staff to keep reaching out, offering fin you know, premium finance plans and ways to support customers and also discussing with them directly. In our case, you know, we evaluated um, the cost of setting up people with additional home office equipment. Because a lot of the feedback was, I, I don't have a second monitor. Um, I need a different chair. I don't have a proper desk. There was a lot of things that would have been a fairly big spend in the tens of thousands of dollars. Mm -hmm. And given that we're in COVID, we were certainly, we have budgeted for a potential drop off in revenue and we're not sure how long this was going to last. So we, we did speak directly to it. And so we understand some of you are in this place at this time. Um, we are not looking to invest in, in equipment that may only be used for a few weeks or a couple of months. Um, however, we will revisit it should this continue to extend. And uh, that seemed to be reasonably well heard. And so, yeah, Sadie, I think you're correct. We were two to three weeks in and um, we implemented these things as quickly as possible, probably within the first 48 hours after doing it. Awesome. And what we did recently is we conducted a second survey. So we waited probably, uh, I guess we could say maybe another six weeks or so, but it was just recent that we conducted the survey a second time. And look at the uh, difference in the net engagement scores. The home workspace score went from 49% to 67%, which is phenomenal. The new daily routine, this was the only score that didn't actually improve, but it was already at 67%, which again, I mean, that's a fantastic score. The communication score that was at 0% uh, following the first survey that we did improved to a score of 67%, which again is, it's, it's amazing. These are fantastic scores. Performance management of 82%. Honestly, I said this to Chris back when we first looked at these scores. I don't think I've ever seen a performance management score of 82%. <laughs> That's a fantastic score. And the tools and equipment score went from 25% to 42%. So I could say with uh, confidence that um, this, it works. When you let people have a voice and you listen to them and you respond, this is the kind of results that you will, that you will see. Yeah, and just on the tools and equipment, I forgot to mention, we did encourage people to take home monitors at their desk. They could take home their chairs if they needed them. Any tools or equipment in the office, they were welcome to, to bring with them. And to ensure that the office was safe when they came in, we had uh, sanitization stations set up everywhere, as well as uh, you know masks and other PPEs available to people if they, if they felt the need to, to use them. To come into the office, yeah. yeah. The safety is definitely a big issue, that health and safety issue that a lot of people had concerns about when they did come into the office. And you addressed that, so yeah, awesome. I mean, the point of us all was that we didn't know where to start. I mean, as leaders, we were also grasping at straws of what exactly to do to make people feel comfortable other than to, than to just say, hey, uh, we hope you're okay. Uh, we're going to get through this. Sure, there's all the reassuring messages, but I think mm -hmm. these were more tactile uh, things that gave us some structure to frame our efforts around and, uh, and move the needle on, on how people felt. Yeah, and you certainly, you certainly were successful in doing that. Awesome. Okay, so um, as Chris mentioned earlier, we've done quite a few surveys um, of the work from home people in over the past few months since COVID hit. And um, I'd like to share with you some of the um, results of the, uh, the verbatim feedback that we've received from from uh, employees. And basically what we did when we uh, sort of pulled all of this verbatim feedback together is we recognized some emerging trends themes, some emerging themes. And basically some of these emerging themes happen to be drivers of engagement. They're very positive uh, drivers of engagement. And some of them were detractors to engagement. So we were able to kind of categorize into two groups, clearly things that um, in some cases you would say maybe the people who transitioned easily and the people who did not, not sure, but uh, the engagement drivers that I will talk about those first. 
the first one that uh, came out was uh, a driver was the ins a company's rapid response to the issue. Um, the the uh, pivot that most organizations made when the uh, COVID hit and, and people were like, offices were closing and people had to move to a work from home environment. It happened so quickly and, and organizations really responded very uh, quickly to this uh, problem. The second driver was the um, fact that uh, the employees were so aware that the organizations were putting their health and safety and making it a priority. Um, it, very clear, like the, Chris mentioned, things like if you do come to the office, here's some of the things that we've done to make sure that your safety is being um, taken care of. The third driver was, well, a lot of people realized that uh, they were very grateful that they were not working in the hospitality industry. A lot of their friends and family members were no longer working. So the fact that they were working in an industry in this case here of the insurance industry, um, and they had the opportunity to continue working from home. They were very happy about that. Um, this, this whole um, situation also allowed for leadership, um, the, the quality of leaders to um, come forward. Like we really found that um, those leaders who have the great, better skills, great skills in um, EQ, dealing with their staff, um, communicating with their staff, they really, um, they came forward for sure. It brought, it brought out the best in leaders. And the next one was, we did have those people who were very um, comfortable with the transition, who seemed to have no issue at all with performance expectations. And that came out in a lot of verbatim comments that, hey, I have no problem with, I, I know what is expected of me and I just do it. So. This was clearly from the people who um, really did not have difficulty with that transition. Others, not so much. We'll talk about those in a few minutes. The next driver was uh, the um, happiness and, and um, comfort level that a lot of employees had with the fact that the employers had reached out to find some of these new tools that they could use that would allow them to communicate with their peers and with their leaders like Zoom and uh, MS Teams and things like that. So it was really um, a great opportunity for them to continue, even though they're working from home, to communicate with the folks in, in their folks that they normally would be working with in the office. And um, a, one thing that really came out loud and clear was there are a lot of people who really loved it. They loved working from home. They loved the flexibility that came along with it. And it may become a preference for some. I'm sure that as much as I know, a lot of organizations are starting to transition back to having uh, people move back into the office. This working from home, I think, is not going to go anywhere for a long time. It may become a new way of us uh, to do business. There may always be a group of your staff that work from home at least part of your week. So that was drivers. Now we also had some detractors that emerged um, as uh, from the verbatim feedback. So the first detractor that came up was basically all around communication. There's three of them and they're into three groups, communication being the largest group. And really it's stuff that we've already um, kind of touched on. The fact that many people, um, because they were isolated uh, at home, the whole feeling of being disconnected and the loneliness of not being able to have face-to-face -face contact with their peers and their leaders was very, it's, it's, it was a huge concern for a lot of people. And they missed that face-to-face -face peer power that Rick talked about earlier. Someone to just bounce things off of, ask questions, um, share stories with. Um, the folks who were having a more difficult time with making the transition, and I think this was more typical really, were people who were having issues around like what, what is changing with regards to my performance expectations? I, I need more clarity. What are things changing? And if yes, if they are changing, to what extent? I want to know how they're changing. What's expected of me? Um, not enough team time in one-to-one -one meetings. Uh, a lot of people had issues with missing that team time and, and having meetings with their uh, leaders, one-to-one -one meetings with their leaders. Um, I know that um, the, one of the um, drivers was the fact that employers gave their employees access to all these new communication tools, but some of the employees were either unaware of them or 
just not comfortable using these new communication tools. And I can understand where that would be an issue for some. Like communicating uh, by using um, tools like Zoom is difficult for some people. And also there was a lot of concern expressed around the fact of um, when are we going back? How's it gonna work? What's it gonna look like? When is it gonna happen? And what kind of precautions are you gonna take? Will I be safe? So that was um, a lot of the detractors that fell within that category of communication. Second in line to that was tools and equipment. And you know things like desks, chairs, monitors, printers, things like that. And employers were able to um, deal with these issues in many cases by just allowing people to take this equipment home with them. But it did not always, it did not always work for everybody. So it's, it's always, I think, going to be an issue. And I think like Chris mentioned, um, how permanent or temporary is this situation and how much of an investment uh, do companies want to make to make sure that everyone has uh, a perfect work um, office at home as well as one in the office because they could all be back in the office in no time. So that's, that still was an issue and it was a detractor for sure. And the last one was um, people having a real difficult time finding that work-life balance. Um, the, the folks that were having um, issues with just coming up with a new daily routine, that was big for them, uh, not taking breaks, forgetting to take breaks, or um, having to deal with the family distractions, the dog, the kids, a spouse working on the other side of your kitchen table, things like that. So that's a detractor, and it's one of the issues that, that a lot of people seem to have problems with. So once we pulled together all of this um, verbatim, feedback and looked at our um, drivers and detractors, we thought we'd just come up with a few tips that we could give that I think applied to a lot of the clients that we've worked with. The first tip being that um, if you have people working at home, just to do a quick review of the at-home equipment that they do have, and there may be lots of ways that you can help, there may be some ways that you cannot, but it's something that if it's a it's just something that if you did a little bit of a review, you might find that there's things that you can do that could really uh, move the bar on engagement of your staff because they have a better work environment. Clarification of performance expectations is always a good idea, regardless of whether the fact that you might have some people who have no issue at all with the clarification. There's a lot of people who do have issues with it. So actually, um, making sure that people are very clear on what is expected of them. It's, it's very, it, it will go a long way with improving your engagement. The third tip would be um, to help people with their um, developing a routine at home, encouraging them to take breaks. It is basically just more coaching them around, this is what you should be doing. I think a lot of people realize what they should be doing. They need reminders though. Um, about things like taking a break. The fourth tip would be um, for giving uh, employees the what's next communication from the executive. The same kind of a message that Chris and, and Jim um, gave to their employees just to let them know we heard what you had to say and this is what we're going to do. Another one like that to say this is what we did and this is what's happening and then another one of when, when you're going back to work and this is how we're going to deal with it. But things are changing every day. So basically even a weekly uh, message from the executive just to let people know that this is what, where we are, this is what's happened, and this is what's coming next. It gives people a little bit of comfort on what to expect. Hosting virtual town hall meetings. This is just like maybe a, a weekly meeting or a monthly meeting where you give everybody the opportunity to ask questions, open an open Q&A session for all staff. Mm -hmm. The number six, um, making sure, six and seven kind of go together, making sure you have regular video check-ins with your uh, teams. Um, daily check-ins with the team, a, a little morning huddle, 10 or 15 minute huddle with the team to find out where people are and, and kind of get a pulse on how people are feeling. And weekly one-to-one -one check ins with individuals. And that way, if you do have any issues that uh, you might be concerned about, like where you feel that maybe the loneliness is getting to be a little much for um, specific people, you'll be able to identify some of those issues and be able to act on them um, if you have a one-on-one -on -one check in. 
with everybody. And number eight, um, somebody in one of the um, one of the um, surveys that we conducted suggested remote team building exercises that you could um, uh, implement with your with your teams. And um, Chris asked me about this when we when we talked about this earlier. And he said, like, what's an example of a remote team building exercise? And I did a Google and I found so many different uh, remote team exercises that you could implement easily. And they, they look like they would be fun and they would actually be something that could help build teams. That would be something that would be informal uh, types of exercises, but there's formal exercises available too. Things like uh, Pat Lencioni has a five dysfunction of a team. It's a very formal program that would that would be something that you could implement with your team that would help uh, team building. This is basically the tips that we would offer uh, based on the experience that we've um, had with our surveys and the information that we've collected from people. So now I think we should open it up for uh, Q&A. Yeah, and as we're doing that, just remind everyone, there's a couple ways of doing it. You can choose to unmute. Uh, you can choose to raise your hand through one of the icons or you can simply uh, send a message and make sure you send it to everyone so that we see it uh, to get your question across. And perhaps while people are getting set up to do that, um, you know, the, the, the follow-up survey, we did it, I think about two months out, Sadie. And, you know, I, I think, you know, maybe part of what helped was people just settling into things. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I wouldn't discount the fact that, that we actually reached out to them and made sure they were feeling all right and we tried to address some of the concerns that they had. Is that what you're seeing from other organizations as well? Uh, in most cases, when we do the follow-up survey, you do see that the scores are improving. Um, I think in some cases, um, I don't think everyone does uh, com com commits to an action plan to the same extent that you did. Um, and I think when, when we do see those situations where an action plan is developed and followed through on, I, th I think the kind of results that you have are probably consistent. Okay. But I, I, I agree with you though. I think probably the fact that they're home now and they've been home for a period of time, they're, they are gonna get used to it as well. So there's a little bit of both, I guess. Well, we had some staff that had actually never done video chat. So yeah. it, was, it was interesting, um, the first couple of go-rounds of using Zoom, we just kind of had to walk people through it, uh, help coach them on it, let them, let them fumble their way into getting it set up and then uh, feeling embarrassed because they were, you know, the cat went running by in the background. <laughs> yeah, I know. Someone's child came in, but, uh, you know, it's all part of it. I guess it humanizes the experience in a different way. Oh, it For certainly sure. does, yeah. And what do you see in terms of participation rate typically from, from employees? Um, I've been seeing somewhere in that like 80% range. Um, we're not getting 100%, but um, I think 80% would probably be a good average of the type of participation that we've been receiving. Anyone have any questions? Uh, here's one. Uh, can you speak on time management and motivation when working unsupervised from home? Do you want to take that, Rick? Well, I guess the first thought that pops into my mind is uh, the person who asked that question, uh, what, what's in your mind about how you feel about your level of trust of your, of your staff? Um, there are ways, of course, we can count keystrokes on computer applications and we can have cameras, but really what it boils down to is you find out in a situation like this how committed your people really are and how trustworthy they really are. So um, I think as far as time management as a control technique, uh, it's, it's, if there's a problem, there's probably no easy way to solve it because it'll be much bigger than just tracking people's time. You, what you were probably driving at in your question was how can we help people organize their, their time? And we like to use a model that we've created called the perfect week. And it's based on Stephen Covey's metaphor of the big rocks, the small rocks, the sand and the water, trying to get it all into the big jar. And, uh, the, the trick is to 
depending on your business, but if you're exposed to uh, inbound customer activity, it's very hard to control your day. So the perfect week model says, figure out the three or four or five most important things to do each week and block time in your calendar for those. Let the smaller items fit around the bigger items. If we try to knock off the small items first, get to the big ones once we're caught up, it never seems to happen. So I, I hope that's somewhat helpful as a response to the question. It's, it's a toughie. Yeah, and I would also add to that, um, depending on, again, better type of business that you are, we were able to run activity reports uh, to see how many activities have been logged into our system in terms of, you know, how many times a file has been touched or how many follow-ups have been sent out to a client or check-ins and so on. And um, those can also help as well. If you look at, if you've got five employees running, you know, 100 activities a week and someone's down around 20 or 30, there, there may be a problem there. They may be struggling and uh, need someone to reach out to them. The um, other, <laughs> sorry, Chris. <clears throat> The other powerful tool to address this concern is uh, scorecards. Having clearly set out metrics uh, so that people understand the way in which their work will be measured and then an objective for each metric. So move this score from this to this by this date. So we think it's important, whether it's working in the office or working at home, that every employee, starting at the top of the organization, right out to the frontline team, everybody should have a scorecard that sets out what they're expected to achieve and ideally highlight the key behaviors that we expect them to exhibit to achieve those objectives. So scorecards, perfect week scorecards. That's Rick. Another question here, how do you deal with employees who perform poorly working from home despite efforts, but do very well at the office? So they're great in the office, but they're not making it happen at home. Well, that may be unfixable. Uh, that may be a factory installed equipment question that person needs social interaction to be able to, to work effectively. In that case, uh, if you're thinking about bringing some people back to the office and continuing to have some people working from home. Don't just do it based on numbers or an arbitrary draw. Think about this dimension, who's working well in the uh, loosely supervised work from home environment and who isn't, and try and bring people back to the office to adjust to that, because you probably can't fix that. That'd be my thinking. So you have to manage around it. That wasn't a very helpful answer. <laughs> no, it, it was. It was. It's, it's pretty good. Uh, thank you, Rick. It's uh, because it's just really not fair when you look at people who just just can't work from home and they do really well in the office. And no matter what you do, it just doesn't work well. So at some point, you're going to have to come up with some sort of a, uh, a compromise, either bring them to the office or do something because at the end of the day, they're still part of the organization. So Right. But yeah. you know, it, it, at the at the root of it all, uh, if if this persists and if working from home is going to be a permanent fixture, you're going to lose some people and you're going to attract some people. So there will be staff turnover because of that. So uh, we we haven't seen these things play out yet, and they won't play out for quite some time. Now, if the pandemic passes in a matter of a few months okay, we will have dodged a bullet, at least in some respects. But if this takes two years to play out, uh, I think we can expect some staff turnover. And just uh, if, if there's no other questions, maybe we'll wrapping things up. I will remind everybody that um, the opportunity here, again, through the generosity of Rick and Sadie and their collaboration with us, uh, with Reliance, is that you can have a complimentary uh, engagement survey done for your company and uh, having worked with uh, Rick and Sadie for a number of years in you know helping they've been a big part of our success and I would encourage you to take advantage of this it's um, it's hard to put a dollar value on it uh, in, in terms of the real value that it brought to to our organization um, are there any other questions 
Okay. Um, uh, one you. second. We actually do have one more question. Oh, okay. Um, one, I'm just going to quickly copy it and put it out to everyone. Okay. Um, it's from the same person. Sorry, I, I don't know the full name. It's SP Cron Technologies. So I'm just going to shoot it out for you, Chris. Sure. If a manager says they're too busy to connect with their employees, what is con a convincing argument to get them to care? Wow, that's a tough one. Well, in today's work world, if you don't have time to talk to your people and to coach your people and to develop your people, I think you're going to have a, a, a tough, uh, tough run to the finish line of your career. I think that's the reality, especially with the uh, younger generation coming in. They expect to be nurtured, developed, not coddled, but they expect to be treated as individuals. And that means you got to spend time thinking about each person that works directly for you and figuring out what their needs are. Marcus Buckingham wrote a great book on that subject called The One Thing. The One Thing by Marcus Buckingham uh, addresses the power of responding to that need and treating your people as individuals and taking the time to deal with them as individuals. Productivity yeah, jumps when you do that. So to the manager who says, I don't have time, maybe uh, try and work out a, a plan whereby they could transition from their current mode of operating to the a mode of coaching and see if you can't help them transition over a two or three month period in their leadership style. What they'll find is by empowering their people to a higher degree, they'll have more time and they won't be uh, putting out fires as much as they probably are now. Yeah. And do they have the, do they have the skills and training um, required to demonstrate what care means? I, I spent a little bit of time with Charles Brindamore, who is the CEO of Intact Insurance, which is the largest insurance company in Canada. And they have about 10,000 employees. So any opportunity I get to glean some information from him, I try to take advantage of it. And I asked him a question. I said, what are the sort of the, what's the number one thing you require of all your managers? And his straight out answer was they have to care about people. And, um, and, you know, we, we talked about what that meant, but, you know, a big part of it was they, they have to understand the structure of expectations in terms of how they demonstrate that care. They have to be given the tools, the resources, and the confidence to go out and, and work with people. So mm -hmm. maybe someone just doesn't know how to do that. They haven't had the training. Um, failing that, you know, I think it becomes a question is, are they, are they a cultural fit? I guess the good news, Chris, <laughs> is that leadership can be learned so if you have someone whose uh, leadership skills are deficient uh, there there is hope people can learn how to be more effective leaders it it's not a factory installed equipment issue so while we're wrapping up everyone i want to i want to thank you uh for being here today i hope this was of value to you thank you so much uh rick and sadie for your time and efforts. And just to remind everyone that, you know, one of the things that we are seeing commonly, and it, it happened to us last week, our cyber attacks are on the rise. Um, we had one of our servers attacked. We caught them in the middle of installing ransomware on it and we were able to shut it down. Uh, but failing that, we might have had a cyber liability issue on our hands. And so we get a call probably once a week from a client who's experienced some kind of phishing or ransomware or some type of attack, this is an insurable loss. Uh, the policies are out there. They're, they've come down in pricing. Um, when they first came out, they're a little expensive. Now there's more competition. There's more choice. And uh, it doesn't cost you anything to get a quote, but it's. I know that a lot of us could not suffer any kind of major significant loss right now, given the, the financial challenges we're having on our balance sheets. So it might be something to consider or not, but at least make an informed decision about it. Reach out and talk to us. We do have tools that don't involve insurance that we can send to you to help you uh, mitigate that as well. So again, thank you to Rick and Sadie. Thank you.